Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode 36, out by Natsuo Karina. And welcome to Point Blank, where today we'll be discussing Japanese crime fiction, focusing on Out by Natsuo Karino. My name's Kurt, and joining me as always, here's Justin. Hey Kurt, how are you doing this fine morning in, in let's say, October? Oh, I'm doing all right. Um, we've had a pretty eventful week here. We finally got our boat in the water, moved it from Port Townsend over to Seattle, and after a, a summer in the yard, it... it it floated. We had no leaks, had no problems. Um, so it was a good good trip, and we saw some whales. So. That's awesome. How did it feel to have the boat in the water for the first time? Was this a significant moment in in your life history? No, it was it was a big deal. It was it was sort of like uh, sort of like releasing our first podcast episode there, Justin. Oh, it felt that, like a yeah. It, it's nice to know that uh, having a a boat in the water is uh, in the same league is having a podcast debut (laughs) of course how are how have you been busy middle of the semester uh just sort of dragging along uh doing a lot of work trying to keep my head above water but i've been all right i uh uh it's very fallish here we had had to turn on the heat for the first time this morning Uh, we had a a freeze overnight Uh, but it's fall break uh imminently and i I get a couple days to not think about uh anything except maybe noir. So uh, that I look forward to that and uh, and looking forward to discussing this book, which is an interesting one for us. I think we will have a lot to say on it. It's a, a book that I, I liked aspects of it a lot. And then there were some things that were uh, problematic and and we'll have we'll have time to talk about those things in a little bit. Yeah, that's for sure. I think I would I would be in the same camp there. I I loved elements of this book. Really, I mean, very strongly loved them. And then there were other elements where I was uh, a little a uh, little hesitant to recommend out to our listeners. But overall, I think it's a pretty good book. And uh, maybe we can start out with a little summary of of out. So this book was published in Japan in 1997 and. It was the winner of Japan's Grand Prix for crime fiction. The English translation, which was published in 04, was an Edgar Award finalist. And this is one of the primary reasons we we picked this book as our Japanese noir selection. It had a lot of critical acclaim. It was popular. There was a lot of talk about it. There are actually a lot of academic articles, articles written about it because it's a feminist noir. And it came out around the same time as the uh, Dragon tattoo uh, trilogy. So it has some overlap, which uh, we might mention a little little bit later on in terms of uh, its shape and its size. It's over 400 pages long, etc. So the gist of it is that this is a novel about four Japanese women, Masako, Yoshi, Kuniko, and Yayoi, who work part-time at a boxed meal factory in industrial Japan, and they get caught up in a murder that tears their lives apart. Yayoi is the wife of an abusive gambler named Yamamoto, who comes home drunk one night and broke, having spent or blown all their savings uh, at a gambling parlor. And he attacks Yayoi in a fit of uh, misogynist violence. Uh, Of course, this does not end well for him in the story. Yayoi kills him, catalyzing the first major plot wheel, which is, will she get away with it? And if so, how? Obviously, she has to ditch the body if she's going to uh, play the cover-up game. And for this, she asks her friend from the boxed uh, lunch or meal factory, Masako, for help. With surprisingly little hesitation, Masako agrees. Masako is the de facto leader of this uh, group of four women. She has an inconsequential husband and a disaffected child. She also has a mysterious past. She's older, and we don't quite know a lot about her. Yoshi also agrees to help, and so does uh, Kuniko. Uh, Kuniko, however, is more reluctant. She has deep fears about taking part, 
she, you would think, might be the, the weak link. That's how she reads early in the story, and that's how she plays out over the course of the narrative. The other characters are all men, and each demonstrates an aspect of the Japanese patriarchy in this novel. We have Miyamori, who's a Brazilian-Japanese man. He messes with Masako at the factory. Is he a serial rapist or just a creep, or is he a lonely expat looking for a gal to love? The theme of loneliness is pervasive in this story, and this idea of Brazilian-Japanese men is based on real life, the relationship between Japan and Brazil, and how many uh, people of Japanese descent live in Brazil, and then they return to the homeland, and they uh, feel like fish out of water, or, you know, half removed, being both part of and separated from the culture. Uh, So that was an interesting wrinkle to this book that I didn't have much uh, familiarity with. Uh, Another male who has a a prime role in the story, uh, probably the most prime role, is Satake, who's the pimp and owner of the gambling hall where Yayoi's husband lost all his money. Satake initially gets fingered for the murder because he had actually scuffled or scuffled with Yamamoto just hours before he was found dead. So Satake, um, you know, gets fingered, and that's one narrative thread that happens for a while. He also has a history of femicide and spent some time in prison for the killing of a woman, so there's another theme. Now, as for the plot, we have our inciting incident, which is the the murder of Yamamoto. That occurs around page 50, which is about an eighth of the way through the text. This is a long read. Sometimes it feels like it. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, Masako takes the lead in chopping up Yamamoto. They decide they're not going to just toss the body into the ocean. Uh, They don't want to get busted. The best course of action, cut the body up, put it in small bags, and distribute it throughout the city. Uh, This works well for the most part, except in one case, and you only need to find one body part in order to, uh, you know, open up a murder investigation. Kuniko distributed a a body part in a park, but it was conspicuous, and it was ultimately found fairly quickly by, uh, by by a bystander, cops got involved and all of a sudden we have a murder investigation which tightens the plot uh, increases the tension and keeps things really rolling Uh, and we get to the real good part of the story which I think is the middle 250 pages we also have a a, a, one more male character who plays a significant role his name is Jumanji he's a loan shark to to whom Kuniko owes money and once the news about the, the murdered husband gets out Jumanji puts two and two together and finds a way to squeeze the women He offers to pay off Kuniko's loan if she's willing to squeal on who did the killing and how and where the body was. Once he found this information out, he used it to his advantage by roping the women into his his world and, and making them a deal they couldn't refuse because he's essentially blackmailing them. And they agree, uh, and essentially this uh, is to go into business together, uh, taking care of bodies uh, that are uh, in need of processing, so to speak, uh, from the criminal underground syndicates of the area, Yakuza and otherwise. So uh, that's the heart of the story. Uh, Meanwhile, the cops are closing in, and so is Satake, who wasn't really pleased with being fingered for the murder. So he has a revenge plan of his own. Now that's all I'll say about the plot for now. I don't want to spoil the ending, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in great depth in the next episode. Uh, I will say this, though. If you are triggered by sexual assault or rape scenes, this uh, book is probably not for you, especially the ending, because uh, it's very much uh, focused on sexual assault and rape. Uh, We were surprised. I was surprised by this. And uh, I I would say if you have a sense, if you're sensitive to that type of stuff, uh, keep away from this book and even, uh, you know, avoid some of the talk. But we're going to save most of our talk on that for episode 37. The verdict. The first 100 pages of this book for me were plotting tedium. The middle 250 pages were well-paced and enthralling. I really loved the middle. I really loved the tension, and I loved uh, these characters and how they behaved uh, with one another as, as the tension rose. The last 50 pages is what I was talking about before. Uh, it's an exercise in what the fuckery. Uh, the best character, I feel, makes choices that make me question whether or not they were the best character. And uh, it was a uh, too much, um, any rape is too much for me, but uh, this was particularly uh, intense uh, with its sexual assault, and I think it was 
uh, not really cool, but uh, other people have different differing opinions on why it was here, and and we'll talk about that later. All right, uh, one one more thing here. Uh, I thought this book sort of had too many scenes. I felt like it was a little bit over long. I thought it could be cut down and made into a the kind of kind of totter noir that I prefer. Um, Sometimes it reminded me of John D. McDonald's Flash of Green, uh, which, if you recall, we, neither of us loved very much. However, this is much better than that, and the good stuff in this book make, make for a real riveting read. I'm going to give it 3.5 hits. If it had a different ending, and if it was slightly shorter and, and tauter, I think I would easily put it uh, above 4. But for now, based on what we read, 3.5 hits. Uh, what do you think about that, Kurt? Do you, does that match up with your thoughts or no? Yeah, I think uh, I think after some consideration, a three point five is is pretty firm of where I would be with this book as well. And for many of the same reasons that you just brought up, I'm, I mean, from the positives of this book, I really loved the getting to spend time with these Japanese working class women, um, which is definitely a perspective I've I've never seen in fiction before. I, I enjoyed that sort of uh, proletarian uh, point of view um, and the struggles that they had as as people who are, are just scraping by. Um, and I, I really enjoyed, the, as you said, the middle part of the book, the pacing, and actually it, it extends beyond the middle part of the book. Um, it's the bulk of the book is well-paced and, and well-timed. And the more I think about that, um, when I initially put the book down, I, I had some hesitation about this mostly because of that ending which again we will talk about extensively in the second part of this ep- or of this covering this book um but also it was slow to get going and those two things combined sort of soured my the taste to me a little bit on this book but but when i think back on it um there are a lot of scenes there's a lot of beautiful writing there's a lot of scenes that were were interesting um and the day to day part parts of the book, which at times felt slow to me. Um, I didn't feel like I needed to know everything that the characters were doing. Um, but when I think on it, that really did set the tone of, of what these women's lives are like, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so it did work and I would recommend out, uh, with the same hesitation that you mentioned, it does get, get very rapey at the end. And, I, you know, it is crime fiction and, and rape does happen. Um, so I'm not necessarily opposed to that being in the fiction, but I did have a problem with the inner dialogue that was going on in the character's head, uh, during, um, during this, this event, this assault. So, uh, we can, we can talk about that more in part two. I, I am a little, um, I feel more out of place with this particular book than pretty much any book that we've we've discussed thus far, um, in part not being a woman, but more specifically not being a Japanese woman um, or that familiar with Japanese culture. Uh, I'm really hesitant to make a lot of, of commentary on some of the things um, that are brought up in this book and, and just letting the book speak for itself. So um, it is a book that's over 20 years old now. Um, so there, there is that element to it as well. I'm sure there's been a lot of shifts in Japanese culture since this came out. Um, but it was a a very interesting look at, uh, at a perspective that, that I really wasn't familiar with, uh, prior to reading, um, the books for this episode. And I will mention that the pacing element, and I, and I was going to do this book for a five round burst and I will, but I think I'm going to be referring to it enough in both of these episodes. I'm going to just bring up this book now, and it's called The Master Key by um, Masako Togawa. And this came out in 1962, and it's also by another uh, female author. She was a, a, a musician, a mystery fiction author, as well as a uh, LGBT icon. And th- the reason there's a lot of similarity here is that this book is also... Uh, about a group of Japanese women. In this case, they all live in the same uh, apartment building, which is sort of four single women. Uh, And I guess this was prevalent in post-World War II when so many, uh, there were so many war widows and and such. Um, And it sort of peeks into these checkered pasts or whatever of the women who who live there. And it has a lot of similar 
pacing elements. And I don't know if that's just a coincidence, if it's an homage, or if that's something that is prevalent in this style of Japanese crime fiction. Um, but it was interesting to read both of these books uh, fairly close together. That it, but overall, uh, go ahead. I was going to say that that is interesting. I, I too, I'm not in, uh, incredibly familiar with Japanese noir, and I did have that hesitation as I was trying to process the content out of this book and compare it to the only other Japanese noir that I read, which was no, um, the book Gun by uh, Fuminori Na, Nakamura. Nakamura. Uh, which had a very different structure, and but based on the academic stuff that I've read and trying to you know parse together what what was about this uniquely Japanese in terms of storytelling and what was more noirish and what was something all else together else altogether, I just yeah I just don't have enough information to go on. So I would uh, with the hesitations that we brought up, I would recommend out uh, or another book. Uh, by this same author, because clearly she she's a gifted author. Uh, that's Natsuo Carino. Um, she has a number of uh, newer books as well. But um, if you want to take a look at Out, I would recommend it. Um, but just know what you're getting into. Subject unknown. And welcome to Subject Unknown. And today, as we've uh, been going around the world, once again we'll be looking at specifically. Japanese crime fiction and Japanese noir, um, just kind of talking about it a little bit, trying to get a handle on uh, what it is we're looking at and how it differentiates from uh, crime fiction from the rest of the world. So um, what were your thoughts on that, Justin? Well, I, I admittedly have a small sample size. We we read Out and I, I read Gun, uh, but I have not read much more than that. So I had to do some research to try to parse together what other folks, uh, you know, have said on the topic, uh, writers and, and academics who, who look at this stuff more with a little bit uh, closer scrutiny. Um, one thing I came across was a, uh, a series of themes that are common to Japanese crime narratives, and this was written by Rachel Hersler, uh, and this was published in The New Inquiry uh, in an in a essay called The Bitter Women of Japanese Noir. And she says that the, the, there are common themes throughout Japanese crime narrative, and they are the following. An inescapable social structure, a culturally endorsed sense of inevitability, and a sense of being the protruding nail that is hammered down. Now, what do you think about those three descriptors? Do you feel like, um, in your experience with Out and with Master Key, did, do you see these themes as themes that, that, that are clearly noticeable? Sure. Well, let's go go through them one by one. Um, yeah, what was the, we should. What was the first one again? An inescapable social structure. So Japanese Certainly. society. Yes. I, I, I would agree. Strongly. Um, and I would, I would also say that that is prevalent. And again, my sample size is, is not much bigger than yours. Um, but I, I think that is true of this book. I think that's true of the work of, uh, uh, Fuminori Nakamura that I've read. Um, I think that's yes. true in the, in the master key. And I, and I think, you know, just extending this out from crime fiction, I th I feel like that's pretty common in the Japanese, uh, cultural works that I've seen, whether that's, whether that's film or, or even, even to some extent anime and, uh, and that kind of thing. You know, it's it, it's a it's obviously a very big deal uh, in Japan, and and it's it's that I think that's something like you know we have a sense of that, but I you know we we're not in that kind of structured society as much, so I think it's a little bit harder for as as American Westerners to to grasp that. Um, but I I think books like Out do a pretty good job of uh, of giving us a sense of of what that might be like. Yeah, I agree, and I mean I think that. At the root of that is an uh, is alienation, that that feeling of not being able to escape, uh, that feeling of being isolated in a system that that doesn't care about your individuality uh, or or self, and I mean which is the seeds of of noir and film noir, and I wonder how much of of Japanese influence uh, you know shaped early film noir, uh, the, the the films of Akira Kurosawa. And all the post-war darkness that emerged uh, in, in in Europe after after World War II, where film noir came to life, but also in Japan around the same time. I just watched *Stray Dogs* by Kurosawa, which is a 
post-war noir tale. And uh, that could have easily taken place in L.A. Uh, or, or in France. And, and, uh, but the theme of alienation and the theme of uh, people just scraping to get by and that working class sensibility, I think those are very much elements that, well, for one, were new to me uh, in looking at Japanese culture and thinking about it because this is sort of the, it's looking at the underbelly uh, of a very hyper techno and futuristic space with mega cities or the sort of stereotypical orientalist look at uh, Buddhism and nature and the, you know, like the, the extremes, either the hyper tech, tech world or, or the sort of passive, peaceful nature Zen state and what about the middle where most of the people live and suffer and feel alienated it, it was uh, it's fun to see that in in this in this fiction and I do think that I wouldn't be surprised if that was a theme in in the rest of the Japanese noir that, that we inevitably read the second one on the list was culturally endorsed sense of inevitability I guess would be sort of a, a defeatism mixed with fate uh, uh, what do you think about that well I mean, I think that one, I think I, I get what the author uh, of this, this paper, why they put that down there. I, I think that that's maybe a bit more nuanced than, um, but I, I think that comes through. Yeah. I, I think that we see that uh, quite a bit in our, our characters for out um, that, you know, they do feel like, you know, their, their fate is determined based on their position. I, I have a, a piece to add to that. She actually uh, goes in a little more depth, uh, which is helpful for clarifying what she means there. Uh, she refers to the bitter women uh, of Japanese crime narrative generally. She says they don't believe in uh, that God's wrath will punish the privileged. She acknowledges uh, her own filth as well and maintains that she does not care. She does not believe in an ultimate moral vanquishment of her foes uh, and therefore has to take action in her own hands, essentially. Uh, which, mm. hell, that reads like a lot of books in the noir genre that we've read, right? Sure, sure. And I think that plays out pretty clearly in, in Out. Uh, these women have to take action and have to uh, fight for their own survival in this world where men dominate. Even the most unseemly and, and, and unlikely men to succeed have uh, the power and ability to thrive in this realm. But uh, women... Uh, even with their wits about them and, and their confidence, struggle in part-time working-class jobs and are at the mercy of the men surrounding them. So I could see this tension being very well played out in, in what I'm coming to understand is quite very much a patriarchal society uh, with, uh, with questions about you know, women's place in, in that world and, uh, and levels of uh, oppression that, that, that are surprising. Yeah, and it's interesting that... Uh you bring that up because I know that in my research and I was going to touch on this later, but I think it's a good time to bring it up now is that when this book out came out, Natsuo Carino uh, had a lot of, a, a lot, it was a controversial book and in part it's because of the, the patriarchy of, of elements of society there. And that a lot of men did not believe that, uh, that you could have a woman who kills her husband, that that just wasn't, a thing that that couldn't happen, and of course we we all know that that can happen, um, but that was a, a controversial issue with this particular book to the point that uh, I believe there was even like one radio host who refused to have her uh, as a guest because of just bringing up this issue in a novel. And, I read uh, that too. That, yeah. that was, I mean, this was the late '90s, and a lot has changed, and hopefully will continue to change, but. But damn, that, that feels like something a little bit further back down the timeline of human history. It goes to show how how bold this novel was and, in general, um, her take on on issues of social structure in, in Japanese society. She, she was a trailblazer in a lot of ways. And when the book came out as a translated in, in English in 2004, she was interviewed in the New York Times and, uh, and Howard French uh interviewed her, and, and this is what she had to say about uh, being a woman in Japanese society then. She says, it's a very confusing experience living as a woman in Japan. If your husband is white collar, the wife is blue. Even if you marry a person of status, the wife inevitably remains a, a rung below uh, the husband. Also, that as a culture, we are not interested in maturity, she says. 
As a society, we are interested in the peak experience for right now, and young women think that comes from being more beautiful. Getting old is worse than disease. You have no value. Uh, again, these are themes that cross over the pond to the United States, too, and sure. Hollywood culture and beauty culture and the whole beauty myth. Uh, but that notion that even if you are equals, you the women will never be equal, will never be the same class as, as, as her husband, uh, that that you know, and this was being said in the early 21st century that 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 was just a little bit of a wake up call to me. Yeah, and uh, clearly this novel out really brings that to the forefront, and I think it, I think this like a lot of the books we've we've looked at. I mean, in in a lot of ways, this was one that broke down some walls, and that there's been a whole wave of uh, fiction that covers subjects like this since then. So, um, you know, for from that, from that regard, it's 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 an interesting. Perhaps not a transition novel, but a uh, an interesting point in Japanese fiction uh, that when this novel came out, um, what was that? What was that third point in the uh, initial article you were talking about? The third point is the sense of being the protruding nail that gets hammered down, mm. and I guess I, I visualize that as somebody being so, something that stands out, uh, that stands out uh, in its surroundings. And how that can't happen, you are you are hammered back into position, uh, and I think that's sort of a, uh, you know, like a the the desire for individualism being smashed down by the requirements uh, of head, you know, nor- normative social culture, which sure. I guess isn't that much from the first part, which inescapable no. social structure. So I yeah. don't think I don't see much of a distinction there. No, no, I don't don't see that either. But I mean, it does certainly come through in the fiction that we've uh, we've looked at. One other thing about Japanese noir, I think, is, you know, I didn't, going in, I wasn't sure if most of the stories we read would be uh, emphasizing the city and the alienation of city life and, you know, uh, the, the neon and the late night karaoke bars and all that. I'm sure there are plenty of novels that do that. Uh, I wasn't sure how much of it would be sort of playing on, uh, you know, cliches of Japanese culture. And what I, what I really appreciate about what we've read thus far is that it is this these people in the middle these people that don't get talked about which is the working class culture of you know the factories uh, the unionists and the part-time workers struggling to get by smoking cigarettes living in uh, motels or small apartments uh, with dogs in the streets that yip at them and kids that uh, are exhausting and not being able to afford bills and uh, when i was reading out in a lot of places I, you know, take away some of the Japanese elements and flourishes, and we could have been in some suburb of Ohio or Oregon, and this could have been written by Raymond Carver. And I, that was really cool to see that, to see this this aspect of Japanese culture. And the, as somebody writes, uh, Catherine Cross wrote, uh, it's the, the gauze of exoticization, you know, the, this notion of Orientalist cliches has been torn away. We don't have any of that in this story. It's just regular people struggling to get by in an oppressive society, which is a universal theme. But uh, there was a unique sort of Japanese twist to that because because of, I think, this overbearing des- uh, need for people to want to conform and not be that nail that sticks out. And there's there's one thing I wanted to bring up, too, and, and this is sort of an illusion or uh, not an illusion, but this is sort of foreshadowing a future episode for us is uh, the prevalence of of the Japanese, uh, especially corporate culture, in neo noir, and um, you know that's something that we'll we're, we're going to be discussing after our world tour. We're going to be looking at uh, do androids dream of electric sheep, and I think this is just something to put on the back burner. But why is that sort of especially nineteen eighties style Japanese corporate culture? Uh, so prevalent in in neo noir, and that's just an interesting thing to me, um, as as something to think about. But the bigger point, I also wanted to see what your reaction was, and this is something I've read not so much in crime fiction, but in uh, Japanese uh, sci fi and stuff like that. But what about the statement that you know? Well, while in in Western fiction, post apocalyptic fiction is usually um, it's a foreshadowing or something like that. Whereas I've read the argument that all fiction uh, post World War II in Japan is post apocalyptic fiction. And how does, sure. be, and, and particularly, obviously, because of uh, being in a 
you know, being the country that was was nuked uh, twice, that element, how does that element play into the fiction? Hmm. Well, that's an interesting uh, way of looking at things, and I could totally see that argument being made. I mean, post apoc isn't about uh, the utter wiping out of all life. It's, it's about surviving, uh, you know, some kind of maximum devastation, and there's a clear before and after. And having two cities... Um, essentially eradicated by nuclear bombs, if that's not apocalyptic, then what is, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think that there's an argument to be made for that. And I think that in a place like Japan, where that was something on the ground and very real, I think it could be the epicenter for uh, thinking about all future works of art as po- post-apocalyptic. I could see that argument being fairly convincing whereas in other places i mean maybe in in some as in in europe too in some places too in places sure, where sure. where the battles raged and, and and cities were destroyed and and the fear and sense of defeat and you know the, the sense of uh things never being the same again were very very much apparent i think in the u.s we might play at that and we might uh mimicry it and we might I uh, think we have a good sense of that, but uh, until you're on the ground experiencing that kind of uh, utter devastation, I think you don't have an absolute clear idea of what it's going to be like. So Yeah, and I, I think, you know, when I originally read that statement, and this was a long time ago, so I can't remember where I saw this, but, it, you know, it was more talking about, say, say, like the Godzilla movies and stuff like that. But I feel like so much of that, at least the tone of post-apocalyptic fiction has a lot of similar elements to noir fiction maybe not your de- your standard to detective novel per se but when it gets more into the noir elements um those t- you know the tough choices and the bleakness of it uh th- there's really a lot of similarity there and um i you know it's it's i don't have an answer for this but i do think it's a very compelling uh theory or or hypothesis to look at <laughs> I was trying to figure out like the origin of, of the name out and sort of trying to figure out if if there were more than one definition or explanation for why Carino named her story that. One one writer wrote that in, in nearly every character depicted in the story, uh, they're all outsiders. They're all in some way outside of the secure social network of Japanese society or, or whatever. I am curious to know whether or not, you know, we talk about how it's 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 so much of it's post-war, post-apocalyptic. You know, there is also this very deep Japanese history, the history of the samurai, the stuff that Kurosawa captures in his films. And it's a long and, and proud history. You know, how much of that translates into noir? You know, I guess maybe the social structure bleeds through over the course of history into the new work. But are there any more, like, obvious elements from the past that creep into Japanese noir that, that you've come across or that you've read about? I guess let's just talk a little bit about the history of, of Japanese crime fiction. You know, I think that you're right. Like, obviously there's a long proud uh, culture in Japan and there's a lot of storytelling um, that has, has been passed down through, through time. And, you know, whether it's the, as you said, this, the stories, the shoguns and the samurais and all of that sort of thing, there's a very, strong tradition of ghost stories and sort of horror elements to Japanese storytelling, which I think is, is related to crime fiction. Um, But uh, I did want to mention that, you know, the first Japanese modern mystery, it it dates, it has a similar time frame to the West in the United States. And it it does go back to the twenties to an author called Ido Gawa Rampo, Ido Gawa Rampo. Um, and he was the founder of the Detective Story Club in Japan. Uh, huh. He kind of he was a he was an admirer of Western mystery writers, and you know he started he kind of brain brought this genre to Japan, and he's credited also with sort of adding some um, bizarre, erotic, and, and fantastic elements uh, to detective fiction for the Japanese audience. Um, and the interesting thing that I did notice that, that this is a maybe an odd distinction, but I think worth thinking about is that detective fiction, at least uh, in Japan in post-World War II, was kind of renamed deductive reasoning fiction, uh, which... <laughs> that just which rolls I, off the tongue. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it does in Japanese. Yeah, true. But I do think that's kind of an interesting d- distinction because, you know, he, in in Western literature, we can say detective fiction, and and maybe we mean something that's hard boiled. Maybe we mean something that's more noir or whatever. But if you're calling it deductive reason fictioning fiction, uh, it's definitely more of that sort of like puzzle who done it type of mystery, whereas you know, it does d- make it distinct from, from more noir fiction. No, that makes sense. Uh, and I guess uh, that lack of clarity is one thing that's, that's common. And when we talk about detective fiction, we have to clarify, are we talking cozies? Are we talking, uh, you know, Amish barn mysteries? Are we talking uh, hard boiled, boiled, uh, or, you know, and some, a lot, some, some of the so-called mysteries that we discuss don't have any mystery in them at all. And they cross over into something more along the lines of thriller uh, so, yeah, I, I could see uh, being precise with our terms is uh, makes sense. Yeah. And just, you know, all of this is really just to say that that Japan has as basically as long of a mystery fiction uh, tradition as the U.S. or Europe does. Um, and it all emerged around the same time. And we have a, a pretty continuous um, chain of, of well-known writers. Now, the difficult thing is and is really finding some of this stuff in translation. Um, That was, I have to say, a little bit of a challenge for the episode because there is a sort of modern school of writers where uh, things are are available in translation. But a lot of, especially the classic uh, works, um, just not not easily available in English. Um, No, and I did see that as well. Um, But then again the number of modern works that were available were, were quite plentiful. And so if, if anybody wants to, you know, dip their toes in the realm of Japanese noir, there, there is plenty, at least modern stuff to read. There are tons of authors. Obviously it's a, it, it's a, it's a country with, with a massive population in, in large cities and a very vibrant literary culture. So uh, I do love the fact that if I want to throw myself into Japanese noir, I could probably read, Japanese noir for the next three years and not finish, you know, not finish the books available. Um, sure, and, for sure. And I, I, this book does, and this discussion does excite me to do that. In fact, I do think that there's something here that I want to understand better. And also I feel like there's enough overlap that I already stand, I, I get what's, what's happening and uh, some of the things that Japanese noir does well as I see it appeal to a lot of my sensibilities as a, as a crime fiction enthusiast. Yeah, for sure. I I would say, I say that I I feel like personally the barrier to, to getting into this subgenre or cultural genre, whatever you want to call it of, uh, of crime fiction is just a little bit higher than some of the other places uh, that we've been or looked at, but uh, certainly with a little bit of background knowledge, certainly well worthwhile to, to check out. It's that time again for Dog-Eared Classics, where we take a look at a classic piece of crime fiction and just uh, give it a a quick review. This time around, I'm going to be looking at a collection, actually, and this is The Best of Manhunt, a collection of The Best of Manhunt magazine. Interesting. I'm not familiar with Manhunt. Well, it is interesting because uh, it's a magazine that we haven't really discussed on the show, but in, in most most people's opinion, it is the spiritual successor of Black Mask magazine. Uh-huh. Um, so there's a lot of authors in here um, that are familiar. And let me just give you a couple before I get into my review. Let's see. We've got, you know, we've got authors in here such as Lawrence Block. We have Helen Nielsen, who I just reviewed uh, last time around in, in uh, classics. We have David Goodis. Uh, we have John D. McDonald, Gil Brewer, Harlan Ellison, Harry Whittington. Damn, that, that, that's an all-star cast of, of writers. Yeah, Donald E. Westlake. It's it's a, you know, there's a lot of very good authors in this book. And I'll just do a little bit of a summary of what's to be found in the book. Um, and just to let our, our listeners know that, that this exists and it might be worth your time. Dot, dot, dot. Okay, so that's uh, The Best of Manhunt magazine and I would recommend it to our listeners. So, so uh before we end this episode, we'd like to take a little bit of a look at the biography of our author uh, of out and that is Natsuo Kurino. And that's the anglicized pronunciation 
um, I'm probably still wrong uh, on this, but I believe the Japanese pronunciation is closer to uh, Natsuo Kid Ino, and I think it would be Kedino Natsuo uh, in Japanese. Yeah. Um, I'm prob- probably completely wrong on a lot of that, so I apologize to our listeners. But you are partially but- right on some of it, most likely. <laughs> Yes, I am partially. I'm confident. I'm yeah. <laughs> I am partially right on some of it. Um, so Carino was born in 1951 in uh, Kanazawa, Japan, and this is actually a pen name of a woman named Mariko Ashioka. She's the middle child of three. She has an older brother and a younger brother. Her father was an architect, and because of that, they because of the different projects he was involved in, they moved around a lot. So she did get a good sampling of different areas of Japan. She got married fairly young, uh, I believe 23, 24, in 1975, and has one daughter who was born in 1981. And you'll also notice that this is yet another author that we're covering who is still around, uh, still alive, still writing. So... That's kind of exciting. Yay. Yeah, yeah. She has a law degree that she got in 1974. And after getting her degree, she kind of she jumped around jobs a lot. She, you know, like just different odd jobs. She worked at a movie theater for a while. It kind of like as a booker, uh, booking the different films and whatnot. And this led her, and this was actually not until her 30s, but this led her to take a screenwriting class. And that's what got her writing. Um, she started out writing romantic novels in in the 80s. And this just didn't work out very well for her. That romantic novels are not very popular in Japan. Um, she did not find a lot of success. And it wasn't until the 90s that she turned to crime fiction. And that was because she was, she was quote, fascinated by the psychological aspects of crime, which I think, I mean, that's a lot of writers, that's a lot of readers uh, are drawn to crime. Totally. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty common. But it was also more of a commercially successful uh, venture uh, for her writing. And that is, of course, where she found her success. And Out, the one that we're covering for these episodes, is her breakout novel. Um, As you said, it came out in Japan in 1997, and she's really had great success uh, since since that time. It won a Mystery Writers of Japan Award in 2004, and this is because this is the year that it came out with an English translation. Uh, it was an Edgar Award finalist. Uh, she's won numerous awards in Japan uh, for her crime fiction, but it's interesting that she lists that as a reader, she's not a really a big fan of crime fiction. Kind of fascinating. Because that's yeah, that, totally. that's two authors in a row who kind of has have said that. Well, you know, I don't really, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the genre, but yet uh, mm-hmm. finding success. So that's kind of interesting. Salute. Well, there's money. There's money in the banana stand. There's money in <laughs> fiction writing. It could be a it could be a, a way to justify uh, maintaining a career as a writer because it's incredibly difficult to do uh, unless you have people pay for your books. That's that's right. Uh, and she has certainly found that success uh, in crime fiction. Uh, she lists her influences as uh, a, a book I'm not familiar with, Two Years Vacation. Is that is that something you're... Hmm. Never heard of that one. Not familiar to me, no. Uh, now, the other two that she listed, uh, you, we've certainly all heard of, The Three Musketeers and uh, Little Women. Yes. And also lists Flannery O'Connor as a one of her favorite authors. Uh, and Flannery O'Connor is great. And if we structured it right, we could actually do a whole episode down the road on her some of her more uh, crime-centric uh, short stories. She was a master crafter and uh, very insightful. Okay, that's interesting because I, I know the name, but I'm not really familiar with the fiction at all. One thing that Carino is well known for is is getting doing a lot of research. And she did a lot of research when she wrote out. She spent six months uh, down in the essentially in the coroner's office uh, taking notes and whatnot. And it's interesting that she, despite this a large amount of time that she did this, as far as I, how I understand the story, because she was a woman, she wasn't allowed to actually see, the the autopsies or the dissections or whatever, uh, so she uh-huh. she had to gain this information uh, secondhand, and that's why uh, these descriptions in out of the, of the dismemberments of the bodies are so, I guess, visceral and and she has had comments from 
doctors and medical staff who have been involved in these things that she got it pretty accurate as to how <laughs> how these things go uh, go. So um, she's done that with a with number of her books, and I think it does show in the fiction. It's, it's also a big middle finger to, to the, to the establishment that tries to deny her access to, to these facts of life and, and, and keep information from her. It's an act of defiance to very effectively render this stuff uh, in a society where you're not supposed to. Certainly. And I also thought it was interesting that she was in, in one of the interviews that I, I read is that she sort of, she lists off her vices and she says that these are things that are critical for her uh, to being a successful author. And she lists laziness, wastefulness, and being too emotional um, as, as those three things. And it, it makes me just chuckle because one to be like to, to list that and say that, you know, that's why she's successful. But the other thing that is interesting is I think that you see those three vices coming through in our characters and out. Um, and, and sort of representative by uh, different different characters in this novel. And perhaps we'll talk about that in part two. Yeah, totally. I can see that. But I, I do think that a, a level of, of, of being self-critical is, is certainly uh, probably, you know, pretty important to being a, an author of this type of fiction. Yeah. She has finished over 19 novels to date, uh, five short story collections, Unfortunately, only four of these books are available um, in translation, and I'm sure some of them uh, will be, more will be forthcoming. Also, Out itself was made into a Japanese film um, around 2003, 2004. It received mixed reviews. And then I did find. Yeah. Buy, yeah, Dave, you haven't seen I it. I didn't at hear all. My, many good things about it. And I, I, I have no intention of watching it after what I've read. But yeah. uh, it seemed like it, they dumbed down the the good parts and they, they upped the bad parts. And yeah. so, one of those movies. And I did see it was optioned for a Hollywood film, but the dates on that sort of suggest that that probably won't be made because it was optioned. Uh, around that 2004 uh, mark. And if they haven't done anything with it yet, they, they probably aren't. Probably not. But anyway, that's a little bit about uh, Natsuo Karino, our author uh, for today. I think it gives us a little bit of an insight into what we're reading in Out and a little bit into the inspirations for Carino's writing. Totally. I mean, she, she has been labeled by some as the queen of Japanese noir. She's an important person to know and I'm glad we, we were able to spend time with her uh, on these episodes. Uh. All right. Well, uh, upcoming in our future episodes, uh, next time, uh, we'll, of course, we'll be looking at our full in-depth discussion of Out. That is episode 36, or no, 37. 37. That is episode 37. In episode 38, we'll be introducing Blood of the Wicked by Leighton Gage, and this is uh, takes place in Brazil. This is the first Mario Silva investigation. Um, we'll be looking at some uh, land issues in Brazil, and I'm looking forward to that and taking a look at the crime fiction of Brazil. Following that, we'll be, where are we going after Brazil, Justin? After Brazil, we head north to Mexico City, Mexico, and we're going to spend time with Paco, bless you, we're going to spend time with one of the gems of crime detective fiction in Mexico City. It's Paco Ignacio Taibo. And we're going to, we haven't picked the, the novel yet, but we're going to pick one of the novels from his Hector Belascoran Shane novels. And he wrote quite a few of these uh, PI novels centered around Hector Shane. And I've read a couple of them in the past, and, and I really like what uh, Paco brings to crime fiction. So I really look forward to spending time in, in one of the uh, coolest cities uh, in the world, uh, at least uh, through through the literature of the city. So those are the next uh, five episodes uh, we have dedicated to, to noir before we come back to the States and spend some time with, well, we're going to, well, fuck it. We'll save it as a surprise for you guys. Fair enough. If you want to get in touch with the show, you can find us on Facebook at Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. You can email us at pointblanknoir at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at Point Blank Noir. And we would always appreciate it if you can leave a review on iTunes. It really does help the show. Yes. Tell your friends, too. We are still looking for more and more people to listen to us drone on about books. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Point 
blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders. Thank you.